By way of announcement, well, we're going to have a schedule change on Sunday from a.m. to p.m. because I don't like mornings. I don't do too well in the mornings. I do much better in the afternoon. So at 6 and 7, we'll just have a double session starting at 6 on Sunday and then at 7. And that way I'll be awake and everybody else will be awake and uh, we'll be able to have service then. 6 and 7. And if there's a, dem a demand for it, uh, or if you just show up at 5.30, we'll just have a prayer service from 5.30 till whenever, and then start at 6, and then probably 6.45, take a break and start at 7. And that will occur next Sunday, so that'll give you a week to think about it, so you don't show up here early next week. Now, uh, we are studying in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5, verse 27. And in keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and biblical truth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity under the principle of freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary so that we might assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. So in Christ's name we ask it, amen. So we're in Matthew chapter 5 verse 27. And uh, we'll start there. You have heard it, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now we have to keep in mind who uh, Jesus is speaking to. And a lot of people in the crowd at this time were uh, what you call Pharisees, very religious people. And they knew the Ten Commandments, so they definitely heard of do not commit adultery. This is almost like sarcasm because uh, they hear this as Jews in Israel as a child. I mean, by the time they were six and seven, they had memorized the Ten Commandments. That was just something about every Jewish family would do. So, of course, they had heard, do not commit adultery. So, he is almost being sarcastic. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. And so, all of them are sitting in front of Jesus, probably shaking their head, amen, yes, that's true, and uh, I believe that. Of course, they do. They've heard it their whole life. But now he's about to shock them. He's about to slap them upside the head, as it were, uh, with something that, uh, well, they just probably never thought about themselves. But I say to you, and actually this is the corrected translation, but I say to you for your benefit that whoever checks out a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That means in their frontal lobe. They have, well, simply looked at a woman, and she doesn't even have to be dressed in a bikini. She could be wearing a long dress and be fully clothed with a coat on, and a man could still look at her with his eyeballs and take her into his soul and commit mental adultery with her. And so what Jesus is doing is shocking these people uh, because uh, they've always uh, bragged to themselves, I have never committed adultery. And Jesus says, well, you've heard it said not to commit adultery, but I tell you, if you lust for a woman in your heart, then you have sinned. So this uh, just slapped the legalist across the face because uh, they like to hide their sins and they know they have a sin nature, or most of them do. Some of them are so arrogant they don't believe that. But most of them are sinners and they've been trying to hide their sins. They try to make their sins sophisticated and so that they will uh, be presentable to other people. And they don't even think about being presentable to God. So all they do is uh, uh, talk about uh, do not commit adultery, yet they do it all the time in their minds. And uh, most of them would have to have a lobotomy before they would quit lusting for women. So they realize this. 
and it's a shock to them. And then in 529, uh, uh, Jesus continues with his shocking statement. And this is very shocking what he's about to say. And he's saying it not for literal reasons. It's not for us to take literally. He's saying it to a bunch of sinners and he's trying to let them know that they are sinners because some of them have been so self-righteous they think their sins are better than other people's sins and they can justify what they do. Oh, sure, they lust about other uh, women and their hearts, uh, but they would, well, nobody can see in their cranium to see when they're lusting. So nobody really realizes uh, what creeps they are. And what Jesus is trying to tell the whole crowd is, look, you're all a bunch of sinners, all of you sitting here. And he's getting very shocking in chapter 5, verse 29. And this is actually the corrected translation. Since your dominant eye, and it is the dominant eye, of course, that controls your other eye. And so since your dominant eye, and it's talking about a mental attitude sin. It's a reference to a mental attitude sin, in this case, of taking a woman into your heart, into your mind, and committing adultery. Since your dominant eye causes you to have mental attitude sin, and of course, uh, Jesus Christ is not saying that your eyeball is the source of sin. That's ridiculous. Uh, like the movie, Ray Charles, or it's called Ray, he was blind, yet he lusted for uh, more women than probably a lot of us with sight. Or men, of course, if you're a woman. Uh, but he's uh, lusted. He lusted all the time as a blind man. So plucking out your eyes isn't going to stop you from having mental attitude sins. And Jesus Christ is not at all implying this. You are tempted because you have an old sin nature. And then from that old sin nature, you decide to sin. You choose to sin. So blind men still lust, and that's something you have to understand. This is not literal. It's a shocking passage. Since your dominant eye causes you to have mental attitude sin, tear it out and throw it away. Now that's shocking to them because they're all sitting there and they're thinking in their own minds and they're realizing that they sin. And so they think, wow, tear it out and throw it away. He's showing them that they're sinners because uh, the first thing that these religious people need to figure out is that they are sinners. Because the whole time they think they're righteous because they follow the law. I've never committed adultery, they tell all their friends. I've never murdered anyone. I've never done this and that. And then Jesus brings up the fact, hey, you can have a mental attitude sin, so you're sinners. And since you do sin, pluck out your eye. He's, he's trying to tell them that they're, he's trying to shock them into submission, into knowing that they're not perfect. And it works, at least for some of them, not all of them. Tear it out and throw it away. This is an analogy to self-judgment. It's an analogy to rebound. When you judge yourself, you actually admit to God you are sinning. Uh, for example, if you commit a sin of hatred throughout the day and you get angry with someone, you name that sin to God and you are actually plucking out that sin and tearing it away and throwing it away. You are naming it and disregarding it and this is the analogy. Name your sin and throw it away. Then Jesus says uh, something else that's shocking. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. And as I told you Friday, this is an obvious statement. Of course it's better to be maimed than to burn in hell. That's all Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, it's better for you to be maimed than to burn in hell. He is not saying that if you maim yourself, if you pluck out your eye, you're going to go to heaven. This isn't literal. He's simply trying to make the point, look, people, you're sinners. You're going to hell unless you believe in me. But he doesn't present the believe in me yet. Right now, he is just presenting the fact that they're all sinners. And uh, if, uh, you, and what he's saying really is, you followed the Mosaic law to a T, you think. But then in your brain, you've been having all of these sins inside of your heart. So you're a sinner. And since uh, you think you're going to heaven by uh, uh, following the law, well, I'm here to tell you you're not. You might as well be plucking out your eyeballs because it's better to be maimed than to go to hell. 
But he's not saying if you maim yourself, you'll go to hell. And people get confused with that and they mix up this verse as having to deal with the, the fact that we might lose our salvation if we sin or that if we sin and we don't do something that is traumatic to ourselves, then we won't be saved. And that's incorrect. Jesus is simply being very shocking and he's uh, shocking these people out of their legalism through being dramatic. And then in chapter uh, 5, verse 30, he has one verse here dealing with overt sins, not the sins that are uh, the mental attitude sins. In verse 30, overt sin. And he spends only one verse on overt sin because people involved in overt sin uh, know it when they sin. You know when you commit fornication. You know when you actually commit the act of adultery. It's a pretty self-evident. You know when you go out and you get drunk. It's an overt sin and probably everyone else in the neighborhood knows what you've been doing because it's overt and it's not hidden. The mental attitude sins are hidden. Now you are no better because you have a mental attitude sin. And this is what they thought, the Pharisees. They thought that because they followed the law and never had a mental attitude sin that they were better than everyone else. And then they could look down their noses at the people who commit overt sin. And they say, hey, did you see that guy the other day uh, getting drunk and flirting with that girl? Uh, yet they probably walked down the street and saw the same girl and lusted for her in their mind. They're sinners too. In fact, they're the worst of sinners because they can't see themselves as sinners. But when you get to the overt sins, uh, most of them know when they're out of line. And that's why Jesus Christ uh, uh, witnessed to many of the prostitutes, uh, many of the nefarious people of the day with whom the Pharisees, well, they despised these people. And the Pharisees looked down their noses at them, but Jesus would go up to them and give them the gospel. And they would respond faster than these other people because these other people are steeped in religion. And the hardest people to witness to are people steeped in religion. And the hardest people to give Bible doctrine to, those who have already believed, are people who have uh, gone into legalism because uh, they realize suddenly it's all by grace and they don't like hearing that. And they don't like, uh, they liked their old lifestyle where they could gossip and malign about everybody because it made them feel better. But Jesus right here is not making anyone feel better. And what he's doing is saying, you're all sinners. The people who have mental attitude sins, you Pharisees sitting in front of me, you are sinners. And uh, those of you who do overt sins, which we'll see in a minute, you too are sinners. And he only uses one verse because they already know it. But he's being balanced and he makes the point. Since your right hand causes you to sin, that's an overt sin. And that's what that's in reference to. Cut it off and throw it away. Since your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. He's being dramatic again. He's saying, look, you're a sinner too. What are you going to do about it? Well, you think you've been so great by following the Mosaic law and you have uh, suffered under the Mosaic law trying to follow it perfectly. And he says, why don't you just go a step farther and when you sin, cut off your hand and throw it away. If you think that's the way of salvation, if you think that, what he's saying is, if you think that you can work your way into heaven, then you might as well go so far as to cut off your hand and throw it away because it's better to be maimed than to go to hell. But he's not saying maim yourself to go to hell. He's being dramatic and shocking. So guess what the question is going to be in the audience when Jesus is done? They're going to say, well, I'm never going to uh, mutilate myself. I'm never going to cut off my hand. I'm never going to pluck out my eyeball. How then will I be saved? So after the message, after they hear all of this, and Matthew probably didn't record it all, he probably did give the gospel within this message. But this is the part that shocked Matthew, and this is the part he wrote down. But later, if Jesus did not say anything about it, they would have went up to him and say, uh, Lord, what, what, what must we do to be saved? I'm not going to cut off my hand and pluck out my eye. And he would say, that's the point. And the point is, I'm going to take on your sins on the cross. Believe in me and you'll be saved. Stop working for it, is what he's saying. And it's the complete opposite of what you might see on the surface here. 
But what he's saying is you can't work for salvation. You think you can work for salvation? Well, work even harder and cut off your hand when it sins. But see, it's not the hand that's sinning anyway. It all comes from the source of your thinking and your choice to sin. We all have free will. And when the old sin at nature tempts us in some way, we have a choice. And we can choose to sin or we can choose not to sin. And that is the source of sin, actually our volition and not our hand or our eyeball. But, of course, uh, Jesus is being shocking to especially the excuse me, the religious people. Now in chapter 5, verse 31, uh, we're moving into the subject of divorce. And we will study divorce in detail today uh, since it is being brought up in this verse. 531, it, it was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a legal document. Now all of the people sitting in front of Jesus at the time, uh, listening to him, uh, knows that uh, they can have divorce. It's part of the Mosaic law. And they know that uh, Moses said, give her a certificate of divorce and you may have a divorce. They know that. And so he is uh, bringing it up again. And then he goes on to say in 532, but I say to you, he's amplifying on the law. And he's explaining to them, uh, yes, you think you've uh, followed the law by getting divorced, but many of you have uh, gotten divorced wrongly. So he's pointing out again that they're sinners. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on the grounds of adultery, that's what the sexual immorality means, but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on the grounds of adultery, causes her to receive adultery. And anyone who marries a woman who has been divorced, that is, divorced uh, for reasons other than adultery, they commit adultery. And this uh, sounds a bit convoluted on the surface, but we're going to break it down in the doctrine of divorce right now. So point one, actually, uh, let's move on to uh, the doctrine of divorce. Point one. The word divorce is derived from the Latin word divortim, and that's D-I-V-O-R-T-I-M. Divorce comes from the Latin word divortim, D-I-V-O-R-T-I-M, and this means separation, and it was used in the Roman Republic, and in the Roman Republic, the husband could divorce the wife. But the wife could not divorce the husband, not in the beginning of the empire. Only the husband could ask for a divorce, and then, of course, it would be granted to him. The wife in the Roman Republic could never ask for a divorce, that, except in the later empire. When Rome started to fall all apart, uh, the woman could ask for a divorce as well, and that's when divorce became very prominent. And uh, so went the Roman Empire. Because I'll tell you this much about civilization. Anytime there's a breakdown in marriage, that country is going under. And I'm talking about widespread breakdown in marriage. This has occurred in our country, sadly enough. In the 1950s, divorce was rare. Now, it's more than 50%. And a, a, a nations cannot survive without the foundation of family. And we are on a fast track toward destruction because of our neglect of these things. And remember, marriage is for believer and unbeliever. In the 1950s in this country, um, unbelievers would get married and stay married just the same as a believer would get married and stay married. Now, usually the unbeliever would marry an unbeliever and the believer would marry a believer. Sometimes it would get confused and that's where problems would arise. Uh, But divorce was very rare, whether it be from an unbeliever or a believer. Today, believers get divorced all the time and unbelievers get divorced all the time. That's a sign of national degeneracy. It happened late in the Roman Empire and when they fell all apart, the first thing to go was family, marriage. Marriage and then family, because when marriage goes, uh, then the children lose their security net, and then they uh, seek for security in the government. That's what they did in the Roman Empire. 
and they had no security from fr from family so they went on the government dole and the government would pass out government cheese as it were and bread and so the government would keep up a large portion of society and uh, you can't do that because if uh, people don't work, they don't make money, and neither does the country make money, so they fall apart financially. That's exactly what happened to Rome. And when they fall apart financially, they can't afford a military anymore. So a bunch of barbarians who couldn't even read and write invaded the great Roman Empire because of the destruction of family. That's one of the reasons. The main reason is that uh, believers uh, forsook their first love, which is the Word of God. And the only reason we're here as a country, I guarantee you this, is because there are few people around the country still listening to the Word of God and care enough uh, to put it in their souls. So God holds back the storm clouds of the fifth cycle of discipline. And the only reason it's being held off is because of a few people who care enough about the Word of God. Now remember, it doesn't, uh, when you care about, well, it's not sin that destroys a country per se. Everyone sins. What destroys a country is their lack of knowledge. And they could be very self-righteous and say, I never, I would never take a drink of alcohol. I, they might be very self-righteous and say, I would never commit adultery. I would never do this or that or the other thing. Well, they're part of the reason the country's going down because they may never do those immoral things, but they never do catch on to the Word of God. And it is knowledge that, that uh, preserves a country, knowledge of the Word of God. And without that, you have nothing. And we're heading in that direction. And right now, the world's going nuts. And so I, don't, I, I do watch the news, but sometimes I don't like to. It's depressing. Uh, because, well, of course, in the news, they're only going to give you the bad news, but the bad news keeps getting worse and worse. I mean, uh, they tried to bomb London again, and they bombed some resort town in Egypt again. I mean, these Muslim radicals are going nuts, and we've got a lot of them sitting right here in this country, and who are, uh, and their Muslim clerics are getting up and uh, preaching to their congregation hate against America. And we just allow it to go on because of freedom of religion. But that's when you cross the line, when you start advocating civil disobedience. Yet, because we're so soft, we let it go on. And eventually, these people will uh, find a way to get at us if we do not straighten out spiritually. And that's the real solution. It's a spiritual solution. So in America today, we too have uh, divorce laws, and it is uh, and divorce is a legal declaration of dissolving a marriage and breaking the marriage contract. And there are two categories today, and that is of course separation. The first step is to uh, get a document of separation. Then you have to be separated for about a year, unless there are certain extenuating circumstances such as adultery. And if you can prove adultery, I think they let you out of it in three months. Or if you can prove drunkenness, this isn't part of Scripture, it's part of American law. If you can prove drunkenness, you get out of the marriage within three months. Or drug abuse, or uh, some, something else that is dependent related, uh, you can get out in three months. But that's American law, and we're going to uh, show you what the Bible has to say about it. And this is how we as believers should follow it. Even though American law says you can get divorced for just about any reason, uh, we must always uh, turn to what God has to say about it and what are his mandates. So a divorce was permitted under the Mosaic law. Now the Bible limits the number of reasons for dissolving a marriage and even fewer reasons for the right of remarriage. Now, there are some cases in the Bible where it's perfectly legitimate for you to have a divorce and then be, get remarried. Other cases, it's perfectly legitimate for you to get a divorce, but then you do not have the right of remarriage. And we will get into the study of uh, in which cases do you have the right of remarriage. Now, this doesn't give you a right to freak out and say, well, I got divorced and I didn't have the right of remarriage, but then I remarried. So I got to get out of this marriage. No, you stay where you are. And there's a solution if you've made a mistake. There always is. And God provides that. So divorce was permitted under the Mosaic Law. Now pre-salvation marriage, divorce, and remarriage is not an issue. 
Uh, for example, if you uh, live to be, let's say you're uh, 20 years old, 21, you're not saved. You haven't believed in Christ. And let's say you get married at 21, and then at 22 you get a divorce. And let's say you do that for about uh, five times up until you're 35 years old. Then at the age of 35 you believe in Christ. All of that stuff in the past is wiped out. doesn't matter how many times you've been married. It's wiped out you get a fresh start. That's God's grace, of course. So even though you have uh, were maladjusted to life, now you've believed in Christ, you have a chance to get it right. And you do have the right to marry, no matter what, because you've believed in Christ. So then he could marry again. But this time, after you're saved and you're married, you must follow God's mandates. So these things do not apply. Well, marriage applies before salvation, but the explicit rules from the Bible do not apply except to the believer. It's the only way they can apply. Marriage is dissolved by the death of a spouse. If uh, you're married to someone and they die, you have the right of remarriage. And I can't tell you how many times I've known people who were married and their wife dies and they go out and get remarried, and the family makes a big deal out of it. How dare he? It might be a year later, but they'll still say, How dare he get remarried? It's only been a year. Uh, she's barely cold in the grave. Well, who cares? It's none of your business. The Bible gives him the right of remarriage. And if he were to remarry six months after his wife's death, it might be stupid, but he is allowed to do so. And you shouldn't gossip anyway about people who decide to remarry after death. When she's dead, she's dead. And there's, or when he's dead, he's dead. There's nothing you can do about that. Life must go on. And that's the principle. So if you have a spouse who dies, you have the right of remarriage. Whether you remarry or not is your uh, volition. And you might uh, be uh, ripped apart by society for it, but you are completely right in getting remarried. Adultery is a legitimate basis for divorce and remarriage. That is, by the innocent party, not by the guilty party, by the innocent party. If the guilty party commits adultery, they do not have the right of remarriage. If the innocent party, that is the victim in the case, let's say you're a husband and the wife commits adultery, the husband then has the right of divorce and remarriage. Whether you get a divorce is up to you, uh, but uh, it pretty much, uh, as per scripture, pretty much the marital, the marital bond has been dissolved. Now, if you have enough doctrine, you might be able to make it, but it's very rare. In most cases, you must get divorced, and then you have the right of remarriage. The guilty person doesn't. The innocent person does. If the guilty person remarries, they commit adultery again. So by if the guilty person remarries, they are committing adultery again. And you say, uh-oh, I've done that. Well, guess what? Uh, you have rebound. And it keep on going in that marriage, even though when you uh, consummated the marriage, that first act would be adultery. That's the way it's uh, listed in Matthew. And so, but then just name that sin and get moving with the spiritual life. But if you don't follow these guidelines specifically, it will mean punishment for you, and you can rebound it and be forgiven. But if you don't follow God's mandates with regard to marriage, divorce, and remarriage, uh, you will suffer. And most of it is self-induced suffering because God set this system up for a reason. And he's saying, look, I know the best way for you to be happy, and the best way is to follow these mandates. And if you don't follow those mandates, there's a certain amount of self-induced misery because uh, usually um, second marriages uh, don't succeed unless there is post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. That means unless you get with the Word of God. And then God will grace you out and you can grow in grace and things uh, will probably work out for you because you become a, 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 well, you're living your Christian life and by doing so, you have more wisdom in life. So the scripture is silent on other reasons for divorce. There's no mention of incompa incompatibility as a reason for divorce. Although we can do it under our law, it's not specified in the Bible. A scripture is also silent on such things as brutality. But if a man is beating up a woman, uh, she does have the right of divorce. 
She must, if her life is threatened, of course, divorce the man. But there's nothing in there saying she has the right of remarriage. That is, that is until the brutal man gets married again, which he will probably do. And then you have the right of remarriage. And uh, usually that gives you some time to recover from such a brutal mess. Uh, but brutality is a reason for divorce, but not remarriage. But brutality is not listed in the Bible. This is just common sense. Drunkenness is a reason in our law for divorce, not a reason for remarriage. And it's really not listed in the Bible as a reason for divorce. Neither is drug addiction. Although under our law, you can get divorced. And if you decide, well, my husband is a drug, drug addict, I want a divorce, well, you can get a divorce, but you don't have the right of remarriage. If you do remarry, you've committed adultery, at least that one time when you consummate the marriage in sex. But nowadays, this stuff is its like a Greek because people just sleep with whoever they want. But this is the way the Bible does it. Violence is definitely a reason for divorce, but not remarriage. Insanity. Uh, you might marry someone and they go nuts or go insane. And this happens quite often, especially today. Well, you have the right of divorce, but not remarriage. Criminality. And that would seem like a very good reason to get divorced if your spouse is running around uh, stealing from the convenience stores. That would be a very good reason for divorce, but still, no right of remarriage until uh, they remarry. And then, then it uh, truly dissolves the marriage. Also, uh, if the person has suicidal tendencies, that goes along with being insane. And they may have suicidal tendencies and uh, go on all day depressed and mope around and uh, always think about suicide. And there are people like that, and you might get a divorce for that reason, but you don't have the right of remarriage. The Bible is silent regarding some obvious reasons for divorce. And uh, one of the obvious reasons is if you are in a life-threatening situation, a divorce uh, definitely would be permitted. The scripture's silent about it, but common sense would say get away from that situation. Somebody beat you up every night, you have the right of divorce. Leave that idiot. But you don't have the right of remarriage until that idiot marries someone else to beat up. Then you have the right of remarriage. Several things are in favor of a divorced victim in cases that are not specified by the Bible. And, for example, you might have been brutalized as a woman in a relationship. Well, because uh, you cannot remarry, it's giving you an elapse of time in single status to recover from your horrible experience. Because if you're a battered wife and you get a divorce, you are not immediately ready for marriage. You're going to have a lot of issues to straighten out first by growing in grace and in knowledge and by overcoming such a traumatic experience. So by having the reason why God doesn't automatically give the right of remarriage is because uh, you're damaged goods. You've been brutalized. You're, you're damaged. You're not ready for remarriage. This is part of God's grace system. He's saying, look, don't even bother about marrying right now. When the time comes, uh, that guy will go off and uh, get married. Then you'll be free to marry. But in the meantime, recover from all of this. This is part of the things uh, that, uh, well, the, gossip, the grace of God provides. If the guilty party dies or remarries, then the marriage is officially dissolved for remarriage by the innocent party. The guilty party is not permitted to remarry. This is found in Matthew chapter 5, 32. Matthew chapter 5, 32. I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for the cause of adultery, causes her to become an adulteress. So we see here that if someone divorces someone else and then they get remarried, they're causing that person in remarriage to, to commit adultery. Both of you are because the marriage really hasn't been dissolved. It might be hard for us to understand living in our culture because we don't follow these laws, but these are God's laws. And this is what it's saying in Matthew. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So if the guilty party remarries, then he or she causes the new spouse to commit adultery along with yourself. 
But, but then, when you consummate the marriage, and in this case, consummating the marriage would result in adultery, then you have the right of rebound, of course. Name that sin to God and move on and stay in that marriage. Don't jump out because you've suddenly heard a new doctrine and you say, oops, I committed adultery by getting into this marriage. Well, don't worry about it. Name the sin of adultery and move on. Because uh, once you commit adultery in that new marriage for the first time, it dissolves all bonds, all previous bonds. So you, you will be officially married to this other woman, and you, and you should stay with her because that marriage in God's eyes is immediately dissolved. And don't just hop right out of the marriage because you get scared and say, oops, I didn't follow God's mandates. Well, how many of us follow God's mandates all the time? None of us myself included, not all the time, of course, who none of us can. So we have rebound, not a license to sin, but you can see with all of these rules, if we didn't have rebound, we would all be pretty screwed up, wouldn't we? So we need rebound, and that is a, a reason to keep on moving in the spiritual life. So legitimate div biblical divorce is analogous to the death of one partner in the marriage. So when you get divorced, to you... That mate should be dead. It's analogous to the death of the mate. When you get a divorce, in your eyes, that person should be dead. And a lot of people make the mistake of getting a divorce, and then these feelings come back, and they try to get back and get remarried to the same person. That never, ever works. Now, there may have been a rare case where they've stayed married, but that is a... That's something that just, it's very difficult to work out. It's just something that's not even allowed to happen because uh, when you have a divorce, it's just as if that other person's dead to you. And so when you see people uh, get a divorce and get remarried, uh, usually you're seeing a disaster waiting to happen. In some cases, it has worked out by God's grace, but usually it's going to be a disaster, disaster because that person should be dead to you. Just as death uh, gets uh, just as death get rid gets rid of the marriage bond, so does divorce. Romans seven one through four talks about death getting rid of the marriage bond, and First Corinthians seven thirty nine. So before we begin an objective uh, discussion or study of divorce, we must understand a few grace principles. First of all, any sin or failure regarding marriage or divorce on your part before you were saved is blotted out. I've already told you that, but this is a grace principle. Any divorce or marriage before you are saved, well, those instances are blotted out. So when you believe in Christ, if you've been divorced five times, you do have the right of remarriage no matter how you did it before you were saved. Now that you're saved, you are a new creature. You have a fresh start. And uh, this fresh start is described in Isaiah 43, 25. And it actually talks about how any scar tissue that you build up as an unbeliever, the moment you believe in Christ, all of it is wiped out. That's the grace of God. So none of your unbelieving scar tissue comes into your new creation. So you have a fresh start. That's the grace of God. Now, if you are divorced and remarried, contrary to the biblical mandate, uh, this is not a time for you to freak out and try to solve the problem in the energy of the flesh. It's not time to say to yourself, oops, I committed adultery myself, and then as a result I had to get a divorce because my other wife wouldn't have me anymore. And then after I got a divorce, I got remarried even though it says I can't as a guilty partner. But you did. So you did not follow God's mandate. Well, rebound and keep moving. And that's what you have to do. It doesn't mean suddenly uh, you've been married to this new woman for five years, and now you say to yourself, oops, I didn't have the right of remarriage. I better get divorced. You're just compounding your problems by doing that. You have a perfect solution in rebound, and, and don't, even, uh, don't even consider your past sins. They're in the past. And you can know you failed and learn from it and just keep moving. Because two wrongs don't make a right. And for you to just uh, jump out of the marriage because you've learned a new doctrine it won't make you right. So you must carry on with your Christian way of life. 
So the solution to, uh, to living in a marriage in which it started out in adultery is the grace of God. The grace of God is always the solution to everything. So you rebound the adultery and keep moving. All sins related to marriage and divorce are forgiven immediately through the rebound technique. And if you're still alive after any failure in the sphere of marriage, if you're still alive after you've uh, failed in marriage and had to get a divorce, if you're still alive after you've uh, gotten remarried and you shouldn't have done it, remember that since you're breathing, God still has a purpose for your life, and that is to execute the protocol spiritual life. That is to grow in grace and in knowledge. That is for post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. So finding God's purpose in your life, in which you will if you continue with a doctrine, requires the learning of the Word of God and not just jumping from the frying pan into the fire by just uh, trying to do something in the energy of the flesh. That is, you run, run out today and get a divorce because you realize you were wrong in the past. Don't do that. That would, uh, you just haven't, uh, you, you don't recognize God's grace. So there are some principles related to marriage. First of all, people are no better in marriage than they are as people. And that's very simple to understand. If you are as a person, a moron, someone who cares not for the word of God, if you are someone who is a believer but constantly lives in carnality, you're a failure in your spiritual life as a person. When you get married, you'll be a failure as a marriage partner as well. So you're no better in marriage than you are as a person. Just because you get married, it's not going to change you. If anything, it might make you worse because you are, have to deal with uh, someone else's sin nature because you're in proximity to that person all the time. And that person might nag at you, or you might nag at them. So it causes conflict. So you uh, must be a, a phenomenal person to be phenomenal in marriage. People who are losers in single status will be losers in marriage. And people who are winners in single status can be winners in marriage. It doesn't always work that way, because you could be a winner in life, and in the past you married a loser. Or you might have started out, I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen with my relatives. The two of them would be starting out as winners. Both of them are using post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And then suddenly, one of the partners says, nah, I'm tired of it. And they go on their own way. So even though one of the persons is still a winner in life, the other one became a loser, so conflict arises. And in this case, divorce uh, came of it, legitimate divorce because of uh, adultery. But uh, this is what happens when you go away from doctrine. And unless both partners are on doctrine, it's very hard to maintain unless that person has enough integrity not to commit adultery. And as long as they don't commit adultery, you're stuck in that marriage with the loser. But all you do is just keep growing in grace and in knowledge, and you'll know you'll still be happy even though the partner won't be but at least your marriage will continue. It takes two winners to have a successful marriage because each is responsible for their own decisions. You're not responsible when you get married for your wife's decision. To an extent, you aren't. I mean, as the authority, you are responsible somewhat. But if your wife decides, I don't care for the Word of God, I don't care for listening to it, I would rather... Uh, go back into legalism. And if she decides to do that, or if the husband decides to do that, that's their choice. There's nothing you can really do about it. The more you da nag them, the farther away you push them. You just have to say, all right, it's your choice. But most of the time, you know this going into marriage, so don't uh, kick her in the butt or him in the butt. Kick yourself in the butt for making a decision, but don't really do that either. Just keep moving in the spiritual life. And all things will work together for good for those who love God. You know that. So a good marriage, therefore, is not designed for happiness. If you get married with the idea that marriage is going to bring you happiness, you're getting married for all the wrong reasons. Marriage isn't going to bring you happiness. Marriage is designed for one thing. Virtue, not your happiness. 
And if you get married with the idea that this man or this woman is going to make me happy, you're going to fail in that marriage because that person will never live up to your expectations. Marriage is for integrity. It's for virtue. It's for you to live your spiritual life and for you to follow the mandates of God. And if you do, you'll be wonderful in marriage. You never cheat on your wife and because you love God too much. Or you would uh, never uh, do things that would be harmful to you in brutality because you love God too much. So it takes virtue in order to have a good marriage. It takes integrity. And it will not... You, If you're a happy person, you'll be happy in marriage. And you might be stimulated in marriage and uh, you might uh, have a tremendous amount of happiness related to it. But there's going to be times when that person lets you down or disappoints you. Well, you can't blame them. They have a sin nature just like you do. So it takes integrity. It takes learning the Word of God to have a good marriage. And if you don't have the Word of God in your soul, uh, that's why, uh, do you know why uh, half the Christians today are divorced? Because they don't know anything about the Word of God. That's why. If they knew something about the Word of God, they would have staying power in marriage. So they act all holy today while they're at church. Yet, all, they, yet they can't even stay married and their families are all falling apart and their children are turning out to be losers. Why? Because they never led by example. They never showed them what the spiritual life was. They never wanted to. They never wanted it themselves. We are a degenerate generation right now of Americans. The only hope we have left is really in uh, the young people to have a change of mind about doctrine or for anyone to have a change of mind about doctrine. It's easier for young people because they haven't been locked into that arrogance yet. But if they get sucked away by someone else who has the stronger head, well then, too bad. They should have had enough volition themselves, though, to make the choice. And the only thing we need is people to realize they need the Word of God. And it's funny, some people hear it, and they know it's different, from what they've ever heard before. And they know that it's something that is true. They just neglect it. So I don't dwell, I'm too busy, got something else to do. And yet others hear it and say, I've been looking for this my whole life. I've been wanting these answers. I've been asking these questions my whole life. And they latch onto it and go on with it. It's all a matter of volition though. Why one person says yes and one person says no, I don't know why. I don't know why the whole world just doesn't say, Yes, but they don't, and that's volition. So the, the reason why marriages are failing is because um, people are going to church this morning to find a mate. They're not going to church to learn the Word of God. They're going so that they can find somebody to get married. Because why? They think that will make them happy. They don't even think to themselves, the Word of God will make me happy. No, they don't have time for the Word of God. They've got to seek happiness in all the wrong things. So they get married, and then a little later they get divorced. Then they go to the divorce uh, club in the church. Then they meet someone else and get married and get divorced. It's, it's a real travesty that people aren't getting with the Word of God. They're missing the whole boat. They're missing the boat of happiness. The boat of happiness, the Word of God, and they're missing it. They're, they're looking everywhere for happiness and they've just missed it. And they go to church for happiness. And that would be the place to go if they taught you doctrine. But they don't. So it's no longer the place to go for happiness unless you come to a little church called Bible Doctrine Church. And it's so funny. I'm glad some people have been listening because they've realized that uh, you can get it by not being face to face. That's a, that's a little joke. But anyway, if you think about it, you'll get it. They heard the doctrine. You don't have to be face-to-face, -face, so they're not here. Mm -hmm. then, yeah. Oh, well, I thought it was funny. <laughs> before marriage, you should have a compatibility checklist. And for you young people, for the one young person who hasn't been married, uh, you might want to write down this list. When you, uh, This is a very important list. And for those of us who are married, if you ever have the unfortunate event of divorce, well, you'll have the list to pick somebody else. Now, that's not funny. That's a terrible thing. But, but this is, before marriage, this is a compatibility checklist. And first of all, the most important ever, 
When you find that beautiful girl and you get to know her and go out on dates with her, the first thing to find out about her is if you are spiritually compatible. So uh, you must have an understanding about this young lady or this young man. You have to understand, you have to ask her uh, such things as, uh, well, you'll be in discussion and you'll say, how were you saved? And she will say, well, I believed in Christ. So you have believed in Christ, she's believed in Christ, there's compatibility. That's the number one thing to know because we cannot marry or we should not marry an unbeliever. If we do, it's a guaranteed misery unless you get graced out. But it's still going to be misery until they either believe in Christ or leave you. So understanding that salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone is the first of the compatibility checklist. You must understand that your partner is a believer. Secondly, you must have an understanding or an agreement as to what constitutes the Christian way of life. You must have an understanding or an agreement as to what constitutes the Christian way of life. Now you might meet someone who has just been saved and they might not know what the Christian way of life is so what do you do in that case? It happens a lot. Well, what you do is bring them to church. Say, hey, I'm going to church uh, this Sunday. Would you like to go with me? And if she says yes, it might indicate positive volition. And then she sits in church. And then you'll have discussion probably at the dinner table or at a restaurant somewhere. And you'll get an idea whether she likes it or not. And then after a couple visits, you'll get an idea of whether she wants to keep coming. But see, this comes into play because you really need a long courting stage, a long courting time for that to take place. The optimum thing would be for them to already know the Christian way of life. It's few and far between, that there, but there are a few who do know of the Christian way of life. Now, we'll continue with this compatibility checklist for marriage so that divorce won't be so prominent in uh, the next uh, 45 minutes or an hour, actually in the next 15 minutes. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, uh, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we've noted and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.